God bless you today. It's always a joy to have you here. And, you know, Your you thousand dollars cannot you reproduce so until it you enters so into a covenant for a Baptist soul. church will pick at their funeral. You can put that thousand we will remind the living that you can still repent and obey. Live from the Mecca of Mormonism, Salt Lake City, Utah, this is Heart of the Matter. Well, biblical Christianity meets, oh man, American evangelicalism face to face. I'm your host, Sean McCraney. We praise the true and living God for allowing us to participate in this ministry with you. We pray his spirit will be upon you and us tonight as we will be taking calls just to let you know, so get ready to dial in and ask us your tough questions. Hey, if you're in the Salt Lake City area and you're seeking to belong to a unique church family, we invite you to visit our website at campus. It's on the screen. We invite everybody to seek out whatever churches they're looking for, as long as we hope you'll find one that tries to teach the Bible, teaches principles of God, not of men. There are a lot of good ones out there. If you're having trouble finding one, you can check us out if you live in this downtown or this Salt Lake City area. Sunday's 10 a.m. for milk, 2.30 for carne. And then uh, uh, if go to WW campus for directions. Uh, so, uh, oh, we told you that we were going to be streaming our campus services on Sunday. We're not going to be doing that. The reason is, is streaming is for people, uh, you, you can get the campus teachings anytime through the archives. We really do streaming for live calls, and that's why we stream this program, so we can have live calls and that interaction. But there's no live calls with church. You can go on the archives and watch a sermon at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning if that's what your church is, if you're disabled or whatever and you can't get out of the house. So it's it, the streaming thing is uh, overkill, kind of uh, obsolete really. So uh, the streaming for campus is over before it even began. Uh, I think we're going to have a good show tonight, but we received a lot of really good emails over the past week. And so I'm going to hit on a couple of those before we get into uh, the best model for doing church part two. Joe writes and says, I just finished your book, Born Again Mormon. I was in the process of actually leaving the church and penned a letter to the bishop expressing why I could not be a member of the Mormon church anymore, that it was not founded on truth. She said, let me explain. I gave my life to the Lord, she says, when I was 15 years of age. She goes on and tells her story. She says, over the last few weeks, I have found him, the Lord, again, and feel grateful and very blessed beyond measure to have done so. She has peace, calmness, which is amazing. She walks with the Savior now, and uh, she says she had a meeting with her bishop. I asked him, what percentage does Jesus play in your salvation? And she said it took quite a while for him to finally say 100%. And then she says, well, you know, with Latter-day Saints, it could be 1% up to 100%. And that that conversation actually ended up the bishop getting up in sacrament meeting and talking about how salvation is 100% uh, based on Christ. Now, I realize the LDS uh, uh, defines salvation very differently than Christians do, but nevertheless, it's a step in the right uh, direction. To me, there's a lot to rejoice over in this email. First of all, she came, she knew the Lord when she was a teenager. She came back to her first love. She's now attending a good church, a Calvary Chapel somewhere. She's confronted the bishop. She's still going to the ward and going to the Calvary Chapel. That happens. And uh, she, uh, who in turn confronted the word, uh, the ward. And so this is all good stuff. This is all contributing. And when things like that happen, it's cause to rejoice. Jared writes, while watching the faith healing episode, I was surprised to hear the claim that John Calvin declared the belief of a circulatory system to be heresy. I said that. Uh, this is new to me. I'm aware that Servetus was credited with the discovery of the circulatory system and that Calvin would later have him executed. 
Although, uh, I, he says, however, it, it was not because of Servetus' belief in a circulatory system that he was executed, but because he was attacking different things about Christianity. And then he, this is a great line. He says, although I believe executing a man over doctrine is still an egregious sin, <laughs> really? Thank you very much for that, Jared. Uh, I also believe that the true circumstances surrounding the historical events should be presented truthfully and accurately, and so do I, Jared. And so here's the deal. The connection between Calvin considering the belief that human circulation or the theory of it was heresy is lies in the fact that the man who really originated that thought, this genius of a guy named Michael Servetus, was put to death by Calvin. Because he believed in the circulatory system and wrote about it, and he was known for that, and Calvin put him to death, there's an automatic belief that he was also put to death for that that circulatory system belief. The Catholic Church was very much against advances in science, and, and Calvin, he would support much of what the Cal, uh, Catholic Church would sustain in terms of law. And so, but I have to support you in this. I could not find anything in writing that quoted or from John Calvin that said, I believe that a teaching in the human circulatory system is heresy. So you're right on that, and it's important. Because if we don't have the facts straight, if we don't stay, stay really focused on what the facts are, it's easy to throw anything you want in there to bolster your argument, and then we have a problem, and that's what many churches do. I don't want to do that, so I stand corrected. I could not find the quote. No direct evidence. Uh, now, there is concrete proof that Calvin had Michael Servetus tortured and killed for heretical beliefs, we're going to cover that when we get into Calvinism, and uh, just like we covered the uh, things that Joseph Smith did, we're going to cover the things that Calvin did, and to me, the guy was just horrific, uh, but nevertheless, you're, you stand right, and I stand wrong on that. Okay, a viewer from Arizona wrote me. She was very upset. She says, I was really shocked and upset when you said on your broadcast of May 28th that Christians should not be involved in fighting uh, abortion. I disagree. So let me stop right here and say something. I am not against Christian people having the right to fight against whatever they want to fight against. People who want to get involved in fighting abortion or getting involved in this cause or that cause. But my point, again, it's always been the same point, is fighting abortion is not a Christian duty. It is not something that the Bible tells us we should be doing. Nowhere. It doesn't say that. Uh, Jesus didn't fight against social evil or ills. Uh, he didn't fight against divorce. He didn't fight against homosexuals. He didn't fight against abortion. And that is not on the call of, a, of the body of Christ. We are not called to go out and fight against this type of thing. So uh, individuals who feel led to do these types of things, I'm a, I I'm firmly believe in the, the, the rights of anybody to do whatever they feel personally they should do. Uh, I'm a Christian who believes a number of things should be fought against, Christian music being one of them. But uh, that's not my Christian call. I'll just, that's my opinion of things. And so you have a strong drive to, to fight against abortion, fine. The writer goes on then with standard rhetorical warfare to support her position. She says, one, Jesus loved the children very much while he was here on earth. I agree. I do agree with that. She wrote, unborn children are still children. I agree with that too. She wrote, aborted babies are denied the chance to even live. Really? I agree. She wrote, a baby still in the womb is precious to God. I agree. This is not about me being pro-abortion or, or, or anti-abortion. It's about what are Christians called to do? You know, someone who has had an abortion, somebody who is going to have an abortion, needs to hear about Jesus. They, they, it is not our call as a body to go in and try to stop or condemn her for having had the abortion. That's my point. 
So uh, her email went on, and this is kind of one thing, on and on with lots of hyperbolic claims and subjective opinions. And as she wrote, the writing became more and more like a living picture of what you might even see out on the street. We're going to put this up in a graphic. She wrote, abortion is murder in the womb. Um, I'm not going to even touch that with a 10-foot pole, but that's what she wrote. These unwanted babies' aborted parts are being thrown in dumpsters like yesterday's leftovers and used for experiments, and you say Christians should not have anything to do with trying to save these innocent lives. She ended the email with this. The picture that came to my mind when I heard you say that what you said was of piles of aborted baby parts and clear plastic bags being thrown and piling up around your feet as you spoke. Even though they were not your own flesh and blood, it was innocent blood. Now look, you know, that's, power, that's powerful uh, rhetoric. Uh, very visual. I'm glad they were clear plastic bags, by the way. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's part and parcel of rhetoric that is used to stir the emotions to get people to fight for your causes and then say it's the Christian duty. But I gotta tell you, the people who need to hear about Christ and what his message is and salvation and love and long suffering are the people who are having the abortions, the people who are impregnating each other, the people with the AIDS, they need to hear the message from people who are out fighting against it. If, as soon as we get that as a, as a body, Christianity is going to take a major step in doing what we were called to do, and that's share Jesus. Elaine wrote in, and speaking of last week's message where I said the best model for doing church, again at the local congregational level, was the Mormon church. She said, we were expecting the twist message that you took last night, and then added, quote, I hope you will bring up the downside of the perfect church model, Mormon, that you've led us to, namely the control of its members at the local congregational level. Uh, she was not the first nor the last to suggest this, that I quickly bolster what I mean by the LDS church being the, the best model for doing church at the local level. I think there's a tremendous irony in receiving an email from someone who is strongly suggests I let everyone know how controlling Mormonism is at the local level. Uh, we got to stop being afraid here. Look, I spent seven years exposing the downside of Mormonism. Every week, seven years, on one show, I give the organization kudos for doing something right, and I'm swimming with reminders about how quick I need to show the downside of the religion. Get off your dog, ma. Uh, he's tired. He wants water. Uh, we lose nothing as believers in when we give ground on something that is right or good. It doesn't hurt us at all to admit that Mormonism does something well. You're not selling Jesus out. You're not crucifying him again on the cross if you admit that Mormonism does something right. Uh, this thing thing is one of the problems existing within modern American evangelical Christianity. It's rabid zealotry. And what I mean by this is if, if, a, if a believer, a true believer, expresses an opinion on something in life that might not coincide with the lockstep process and thinking of the American evangelical community, their salvation is, is thrown into question. And that's just part of this rabid uh, fundamentalism that exists within the body. I'm not saying the writer Elaine was doing this here, but her suggestion that I quickly remind everyone the downside of the way Mormonism operates at the local level illustrates the kind of control, the uh, c controlling undercurrent that comes with this form of Christianity. We're going to get to all these points in the future, but let me ask you some questions, and I'm not making a stand one way or another, but can a person be accepted as a Christian if they have ideas or opinions that differ on issues like DNA, uh, the 24-hour creation story? Uh, the emails I receive tell me no. I've had emails write and say, if you don't believe the world was created by God in six 24-hour periods, you deny Christ. 
I tell you, I don't deny Christ. He's my King and God, Savior, Lord. I don't believe the 24-hour period. I'm not alone. Norman Geisler, I mentioned that before. Great scripturing. Doesn't believe the 24-hour either. He's an old earther. Is it allowable for some of you rabid zealots? King James only? Is that the only Bible that we can read? Can spiritual gifts, they have an expression that must be done in a certain way? Can you drink alcohol or are you, are you damned if you do? Homosexuality, dinosaurs, euthanasia, stem cell research, the death penalty, political leanings. Can a Christian be a communist, a non-Calvinist, a Calvinist? Worst of all, can a Christian be a, a damn Democrat? Is that possible? I mean, in this nation, it's impossible the way that you're treated if you have ideas that are outside of these types of things. Well, what does the Bible say? That's where we go and we look at these things. When Christians' uh, love is really present, really present in the heart of somebody, all those things I just mentioned become really insignificant. They become something that is in God's hands. We are here to share him, teach him, love him, love others. And so all those other little things that people make such a mountain to climb on, they go away. All right, finally we received this email from Doug D, and it serves as a perfect lead-in for our topic tonight, uh, which is, does what, who does church best part D? All right, his email said, Sean, I really enjoy watching you because you expose Mormonism at its best, and you really are up here on every, uh, uh, up on every doctrine, but I want to make sure about what you believe in the doctrine of salvation. I am a Baptist, and I believe that salvation is by faith alone, plus nothing, minus nothing, faith without any works. And then he cites Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And then he writes, I also believe I can never lose my salvation no matter what I do. Even if I wanted to go to hell, God would not send me there because his promise still stands. Please clarify if you believe what I just wrote. I know it seems very basic, but I want to make sure. Okay. As I said, the last email is a perfect segue into our discussion tonight. So before we get into it, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we pray you'll help me, those who are seeking for truth, those who want to know you, the true and living God, that your spirit will speak uh, mightily tonight. And People will forget the things that I say and do that are not correct, but we look to you for our truth, your word. Pray for our volunteers, staff, and everybody else who helps with the show. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Last week, after providing a very rough sketch of how church has morphed and grown over the past several hundred years in America, we came to some general conclusions. First, we suggested that churches like Calvary chapels and other non-denom churches that are out there have done a really good job of emphasizing the first principle of Christianity, which we liken to the vertical post of the cross, right? Remember, defining it as man's relationship to God through Christ, the event of salvation, and the focus on Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm standing there, and there's the, the vertical line. My feet are on the ground. I'm looking to the sky. God is looking down. This is the relationship those non-denoms and Calvary chapels very good at doing. We mentioned that this is the proper horse before the cart in Christianity. It's where salvation is received. There can be no other thing in our Christian walk without it being firmly in place. It's the first thing, okay? Then we said that once that vertical post is firmly planted in the earth and therefore naturally pointing to the heavens, symbolic of the relationship saved human beings here have with God there, okay? Then we said the second part of our taking up our cross and walking with it daily occurs, and that's the addition of the horizontal beam, okay? And we said that if the vertical beam, among other things, is faith, reliance upon God on high, the first great commandment, loving God, then the horizontal represents our faith in God being expressed by love of neighbor to people who live on either side of us or who are our family and friends, etc. human beings. The second great commandment. In this department, we suggested that many uh, respects, that in many respects, the institutional denominations have done a far better job in what we called making disciples 
because they are more inclined to implement the biblical model for doing church than large non-denoms, uh, Jesus movement churches, or mega churches, like the Joel Osteens or whatever you might want to say, who often hold stop and go church, making true discipleship impossible. That was everything we covered. At this point, we loosely listed a number of models or pictures that are available in scripture that help us understand what the church model ought to contain. And we said there's an idea that first, the church is a flock. That's what we brought up. And then using a flock in our example of how to do church best and biblically, we said that a flock would be limited in size as no true shepherd, a real shepherd out there in New Zealand or wherever, Israel, would have a flock of 10,000 sheep or of 5,000, probably of even 1,000, because they just don't know them when they get to that size. That's the model, so we take it. Sorry, Osteen. And we also said that the flock would have a shepherd, a pastor, it's the same word, when you look at the, the etymology of the word, who would know the sheep's names. That's what Jesus said. He knows his sheep, he's the model shepherd, so sub-shepherds to him would also know the congregate's names. And then we mentioned that the pastor would not take the flock and, and dole them out to a hireling or a co-pastor or sub-shepherd beneath him because that hireling does not care for the flock like the senior pastor would, and that's a teaching of Jesus. He said that when the robber comes, a hireling of the sheep will flee because he doesn't have the vested interest in the, in the flock that a shepherd should. The next concept that we talked about is that the local church is a body, and we said that to do church best and biblically, the body would be composed of members, members, body parts. And I might add that all members of a body have function. They, they do something in the body. They apply what, how they have been built and how they have been created, uniquely, wonderfully made, and the skills they have, just like the earlobe does, just like the heart does, just like the nerves do, the finger, the foot, whatever, all those parts, those members of the body have something to contribute to the whole cause. We noted that membership is vital in congregations because in this capacity, individuals know each other. Um, uh, my, my head knows very well my foot, and when an anvil falls on it in the Coyote movie, my foot will pulsate, and my head knows that. That's how the body should know each other. If it's too big, you never know when there's injury and woundedness and people who need help within it. And I would add that the Bible makes it very, very, very clear that the head of that body is not the pastor, but Christ that individuals have the relationship directly to Christ. The pastor is not an intermediary at all. He is there to help protect the flock from being harmed from invaders and all that feed the sheep, the word of God, etc. pastor teachers. Scripture also presents us with a picture of the local congregation being a family, again, members. And uh, from this concept and some others, we see the importance of water baptism in a true, correct, biblical model church. This is how it appears to function as far as I can tell. You enter into the flock uh, in the area in which you live. All of this is bolstering the LDS model because if you live in the area, you have interaction with those people, members of your family, members of the body in the flock. If you drive 40 miles to go to a church that you like because it feeds you, it doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're functioning in the, in the way it should be and the way it was in the early church. Remember, there was a church at Corinth, there's a church at Ephesus, a church at Rome, all geographically based and centered. Today, why pastors don't say, you know, if you live outside this area, you should go to another church. Now, maybe after, I don't know, something can be done. I'm talking about revolutionary terms. I'm talking about uh, theory, not practicality. So I don't know how it would work, but I'm just telling you what the biblical model is. And then listen, once uh, you come and you join that local congregation, you're buried, baptized with Christ, and baptism shows a symbol. You're identified with everybody. They can see that you were buried with Christ, risen to new life, and then they work to help you, and you work to help them live up to the commitment that you said you would at baptism. Born into a new family, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. You're now spiritually born into a new family, baptized with this water, symbolic of that family unity, and together you help each other out. Should be that way. Can't do it if it gets too big, all that other stuff. 
Okay, so that is uh, now to the email, the last email that I said really plays into what we're talking about. He says, salvation, how is it obtained? My view to the writer of that email is the biblical view, I think, which is salvation by grace through faith, uh, period. Nothing else, nothing more, no works, no rights. My view is the vertical beam of the cross, God reaching down, man looking up, receiving what God offered through his son. By faith, grace is bestowed, salvation occurs, period, blank, done. Every one of us receive the gift of grace through faith. Is it clear? Do you get that? Because I'm going to shake you in a second. But do you get that part? Okay, good. Then the writer of that email says, I can never lose my salvation no matter what I do. Even if I wanted to go to hell, God will not send me there because his promise still stands. Please clarify if you believe what I just wrote. I know it seems very basic, but I want to make sure. I don't know why he wants to make sure what I think, but he does. Okay, salvation is by grace through faith, period. Keeping, maintaining, continuing in him, abiding in the vine is by grace through faith too. You're saved by grace through faith. You abide in the vine by grace through faith. Everything is by grace through faith. We do not gain salvation through our good works. We don't lose our salvation through a lack of good works or bad works. It is by faith. Got that? Okay, saved and kept by grace through faith. Any question on how salvation comes or how it is kept, go back to by grace through faith. There are churches that will add in. You've got to do works. You've got to be, in order to keep your salvation, you have to then prove it is all down to grace through faith. To believe salvation is lost by personal failure or mistake or personal weaknesses is a freaking lie. And, and he's our true shepherd. He, a shepherd never lets his sheep go. We are his. Listen, by faith, not his by perfection, not by works, not if we prove ourselves daily. We are his, remember, by and through the same means, grace through faith. The real question is not can someone lose their salvation? The real question is, can a person choose to walk from salvation? Absolutely. God is not a despot. You think that you can say, I want to go to hell after you've been saved, and God is going to say, no, 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 my little lamb, you are going to go to heaven. I demand it. I sincerely think you're wrong. And I'm going to use the scripture to prove it to you right now. If this was not the case, if it's only the vertical, only the Jesus moment, only be saved by grace through faith and you are done, perfect, over, we wouldn't have churches. There's no reason for them. Sure, we can grow in faith. Sure, we can do good works and all those things. But there's no reason for the church. There's no reason for this part at all. If salvation is salvation by grace through faith, period, that's all that matters, you're wrong, okay? So all we need to do is send missionaries out to save people and just let them go to do whatever they're going to do. Because that is, the, according to you, that is the pivotal moment of the whole Christian walk. Your, your, your salvation, what you experience through Jesus, and it's done. It is done as long as you receive the grace God gives you through faith, not through works. All right? So... I believe the Bible and what it teaches and tells us contextually, and every model and picture and illusion is purposeful. They're not in there for no, for, without reason. And so one of the purposes of the church is to help believers who have been saved by grace through faith to continue to grow and abide in faith, in faith, okay? Before we go to the phones, let me present to you a chapter in scripture. It's short. It's not long, and I'm going to take out chunks of it so we don't cover the whole thing, actually. But the chunks I take out actually support my argument, so it's not I'm doing it for convenience sake. Then we're going to go to the phones. Let me tell you what the phone number is if you're looking to call, because I haven't memorized it yet. 801-590-8413. 801-590-8413 to talk about whatever you want. But the chapter I want to talk about is Hebrews chapter 3. 
Because of time, like I said, I'm gonna skip some blocks, but read with me if you want Hebrews chapter three. Listen to what it says, verse one. Wherefore, holy brethren, that means sisters too, partaking of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. So the thing I wanna point out from that is it is written to holy brethren, brethren, not outsiders, these are believers, and to those who are partakers of the heavenly calling. You got that? It's said clear in the first line. In verse two through five, the writer goes on to say how Jesus is much more worthy, created much better than Moses, and makes that whole argument. Then jump with me down to verse six, where he says, but Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we if, we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end. What are of his house? We, it says we are of his house if. If. What is an if doing in there? What is that all about? I thought unconditionally saved, no matter what, unconditionally of his house. No? Read on. In verse 7 through 11, the writer then makes a comparison of the children of Israel and their hard hearts and not being able to enter into the promised land because of faithlessness, because of unbelief uh, when they were in the wilderness. And then he says to believers now, making the comparison, verse 12, wherefore, ready? Take heed, brethren, peoples in the church, people in the church, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He's giving a warning there. He says, listen, I take heed. Look at what the children of Israel did. They wandered around for 40 years, couldn't enter into the promised land because of unbelief. He says, wherefore, take heed, brethren, those of you who are in the church, unless there's an evil heart of what? Unbelief. The only sin a believer commits after they've been saved is that of faithlessness and failing to love, because those are the two commandments, to believe and to love. We don't have all the other commandments on our back. You don't have to micromanage your life. Oh, I drank a little too much. Oh, I got mad at the driver. Oh, I did That is not what Christ is. He's released you from that burden. But he says, listen, continue, abide in the vine, believing. Don't lose that believing. And then with that believing, later will come love. All right, so the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, brethren, don't do the same thing as the children of Israel did in unbelief. Take heed lest you be, get an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. What does God give believers to help inoculate us from the sin of unbelief? Read verse 13. But, he says, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through what? Hardened through what? The deceitfulness of sin, he says. Let me be clear here. I believe that the deceitfulness of sin there is the sin of unbelief. I don't believe it's the deceitfulness of adultery or lying or gossiping or any of the other things that are offensive to God. Those things were taken care of on the cross, past, present, and future by him, our king. They are erased, wiped away. So you are not on that mode anymore. You gotta free yourself from that so that you can be free from those actions. However, the sin of unbelief, he says, you know, exhort one another daily. That means hear the word, unless you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, I'm willing to admit that sin, the other types, the adultery, and the, can harden a heart. I'm, I'm willing to admit that if those things are allowed in a believer's life long enough, they can harden a heart to unbelief. But the ultimate sin that you commit as a believer where you walk from your salvation is unbelief. It's lacking faith. And then he goes on that... Uh, and says, for we, verse 14, are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, that's when you were born again, steadfast until the end. If we hold the beginning of our confidence. It's talking about if you continue on in faith, you're gonna fail in your flesh, you're gonna make mistakes, but continue on looking to, I tell my daughters throughout their life, listen, when, I, when I'm dead and gone, which may be tomorrow or whatever, go through whatever trials you're gonna go through, suffer through what we are gonna suffer. I mean, it's gonna happen, we're in this life, but never let go of him. Never let go of him. The world may try through philosophy to get you to not believe. It may rationalize and intellectualize and philosophize all these reasons why to let go of belief in him because the world knows, the darkness, that that is the thing 
that will detach a true believer from the vine. And once you're detached, Jesus says in the parable of the, uh, of the vine in, in John chapter 15, boom, cut off, taken away, destroyed, because you don't bear fruit, fruit of love, which comes part and parcel with belief. Again, the writer reiterates that he is speaking to believers, for we are made partakers of Christ. And then he reiterates the condition of belief of, for believers if, if, if we be, uh, hold the beginning of our confidence to the, to the end. This flies in the face of once saved, always saved, uh, uh, which is a lie, a Calvinistic lie. Uh, again, we do not maintain our salvation by working and sweating and worrying and fretting and, oh God, please save me, please save me. You were saved. Do you believe it? Do you, do, you, do you trust in him that he did that for you? That's the key. And by this way, we obtained our salvation, by his grace through our faith. If we walk from faith, we walk from his grace. Simple and biblical is that. Okay, and I don't mean fluctuations in, oh man, I'm really not sure I believe this right now. We all have that. It's when you walk and say, forget this stuff, forget it all. I don't believe him, I don't believe in God, I don't believe this whole deal, I am done with it. And once you do that scripture later, we could prove it after I brought it up, it says there's no more salvation from sin. There's no more redemption. The blood of Christ is gone at that point. It's not the up and down of life. It's the cutting off and saying, I don't believe. You show me somebody who once believed and then later says, I don't believe. They have that right to do it. God is a gentleman, a God of freedom. They have that right to do it. They are gone. And they don't come back. They just don't. And that's what is cut off, okay? He ends it with uh, uh, the writer goes on and says that if we harden our hearts as the children of Israel did in the wilderness, we will enter. Uh, if we don't harden our hearts, we will enter into his rest. And he wraps the chapter up, telling us why the children of Israel could not enter into the promised land. To just tie it all together, verse 19, he says, So we see, it's such a great little line, so we see, they, the children of Israel, could not enter in because of unbelief. That's the end of the chapter there. So, um, Here's the important applicable point. We'll go to the phones. I don't know. No, nothing's up yet. You can call us. Uh, phone number, put it on the screen, whatever it is. If you have a question or comment, bring it on. We want to talk. But here's the important and applicable point of all this. In the end, how people do church is, a, uh, is representative by their soteriology, by how they believe we are saved or not saved. It's a direct reflection. For instance, those who say that this experience in and of itself suffices along the side of the road in your bedroom, you came to know the Lord, you received what he had, period. You'll find churches that are all about that. You walk in, you walk out. You have the message, you, you worship, you praise Jesus like there's no tomorrow and you walk out. There's, there's no discipleship really. That's how they do church because based on their soteriology. All right, if you have a church that says, listen, the Jesus experience must be followed up by a life of hard work and dedication in order to maintain your belief, you'll have a church that operates off the Jesus experience a little bit, and then, boy, they put you to work, and you better do that work, because if you don't, you're gonna lose that salvation. And based on their soteriology, they do church. So the Bible is clear contextually. Anyone who has saved has been saved by grace through faith. And if they want to abide in the vine, they abide in the vine by grace through faith. This doctrinal position per perfectly describes how to do church. Now, when I said the Mormon church does it best, I'm talking about the mechanics. Definitely not the doctrine. Definitely not their false priesthood. Definitely not their worship of Smith and all their extra biblical doctrines, but the mechanics of helping people, of course, retain the Jesus experience, but then apply it and continue to grow in faith is modeled really, really well by the Latter-day Saints. Okay, uh, while the operators are, we got a, a call, Doug in Boston, Massachusetts. I'll get to him in a second. I just got to ask you really quickly for... Uh, to do three things and to prayerfully consider a fourth. Uh, the first one is, uh, if you're watching streaming video uh, now or in the archives, 
Will you tell your friends about Heart of the Matter, HOTM.TV, and to be able to come on? Last week, we had a banner week of people, like 700 people. That's up from 400 and something, and it's growing. So it costs us more every time we do that, but we don't care. We want to get the message out. So tell your family and friends, hey, on Tuesday nights at this time, wherever you live, go on and watch the live streaming. And that's our first request that you do. The second quest is keep us in your prayers. Uh, I am the worst of worst in men of flesh. I need God on my side to keep me in the spirit. I sometimes balance very tenuously on that fine line. And so uh, I need your prayers to keep me over on the side of the spirit. And I know it helps because I sense them as I'm going through my life and day. Third, check out our online store at www.hotm.tv. We have a number of products that are unique to this ministry and we think they have value. You can look to see for yourself, but check that out. And finally, Uh, Just consider, prayerfully consider, if you are not on a limited fixed income, if you're not an elderly person, a disabled person, but if you are, if you're in a position and God leads, then prayerfully consider supporting the ministry financially. We would prefer a lot of smaller donors than uh, uh, just a few big ones. Uh, And so that's how uh, we've seen that works better than have a few big ones. So I always tend to tick off and then they leave. And so... uh, that's how that works. All right, so tell your families and friends, pray for us, consider our online store, and support us financially if you're able, in a position, and led. Let's go to Doug in Boston, Massachusetts on line two. Doug, you are on Heart of the Matter. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. Hey, so uh, I'm the one that sent the last letter, and I just uh, had a question. Um, so, I mean, like, I, I, of course I'm a believer, and I know it's eternal. I cannot lose it. And but the thing is, this uh, there's a there's a verse that kind of says, um, if we believe not yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, give me the pa- give me the reference. We have time. I'll look it up. Do you know it? Second Timothy two thirteen. All right, let's look it up really quick. Second Timothy two thirteen. Is that in the Bible? Just kidding. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2.13. All right. Timothy exhorted to constancy and perseverance. What verse? 13? Okay. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Ooh, that's a good passage. I think you got. I think you got me on a passage. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I have to look at the Greek to see the if that is like a. Uh, in the Greek language, they have if, whether it's permanently there, if it's in the future there, or if it's temporarily there. Talking about if you believe not. So let me do my homework. That is a great passage to refute what I said about if you lose belief. I would say in okay. the context of Scripture. That it doesn't mean what I'm reading, that it says in the English, but we'll look and see. Okay. It's just that, you know, uh, what I'm trying to say is this. It's, it's, of course, I'm not going to stop believing. Because once, it, it's like this. It's like once you believe on something and that's true, of course you're not going to be like, okay, I'm, I'm going to unbelieve it. Okay, well, let me ask you. It's impossible for that to happen. Well, it's not impossible. Let me ask you something, okay? How about the angels who were in God's presence who rebelled against him? Satan himself, he was in his right. presence and said, forget it. Right, right. I understand that. But, I mean, like, we're talking about, like, uh, a salvation between humans to, to, towards God, not angels. Okay, so, on, so you're talking specifically on humans then, right? Right. Exactly. Okay, so let me, let me go to this then. I mean, I, I got to do it. Since uh, we have any other call, no. So let me do this, Doug. You with me? Yep, I'm with you. Okay. One second. Sorry, we'll get there. Okay. You have your Bible open? Um, 
I have some references <laughs> open, yeah. Okay. So you heard me read what it says in Hebrews, right? Yeah, uh, what, what Hebrews uh, 3 was it? Yeah, all of the chapter. Okay, in, in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Let me read that to you, okay? Hebrews 6, Hebrews 4, six, six right? 4 through 6. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, that's a lot of stuff, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So would you say it's impossible for a human who once believed to fall, hearing what the writer of Hebrews and how they described people who did certainly believe? Well, no, I, I, I don't think it's impossible for them to fall away. And, um, let's say they step out of church and uh, they just stop being faithful, basically. Stop. Let's say they are somebody that's faithful to God. They, they believe. They go to church every time. But it, it is impossible to fall away and stop, like, backsliding. And uh, just, just like King Saul did. King what? Saul was uh, an example in the Bible of somebody that believed and then later on just ended dying tragically because he, he, he fell away. Okay, but, but Doug, this state. says if you fall away, it's impossible to renew them to repentance. They crucify themselves, the Son of God, afresh and put him to an open shame. This isn't talking about the ups and downs that we all go through. It's talking about walking from faith. Okay. All right, let me get, I, okay, I want, look at, this is what we're going to do because we have a lot of calls now. 2 Peter 2, 19 through 12. Hebrews, uh, 2 Peter 1, 9. Hebrews 3, 6. Colossians 1, 23. Hebrews 10, 26. 1 Timothy 4, 1. 1 Timothy 5, 12, 11 through 12. And uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 5 is excellent. Those are some, and they lead off into a whole bunch of others. So I agree with you, though, Doug, that you have come right. to faith. He does not let you go. And your ups right. and downs of faith and sin and whatever else, he does not base, but he does base his relationship with you on the same thing that led you to him, faith. Okay? I got to go. We got other calls. Thanks for calling, to, uh, Doug. Can I just give one more verse? Yeah. It's, um, it's on uh, John. Yeah. Chapter 10, verse 28. What does it say? It says, it says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That includes yourself. Any man pluck them out of my hand. Okay, we have to, I'll read that next week contextually with everything around it. And having uh, taught John twice through, I think that we'll be able to see contextually uh, it has purpose. You can't just take one, because if what you're saying supports what you're saying, then all the passages I just gave you must be wrong, okay? Or I'm interpreting right. them wrong. So we have to look at context, which we will do. Thanks for your insights, okay. Doug. Thank, thank you. All okay. right, bye. God bless, bye-bye. We're going to uh, Ray on one. Ray, uh, in Salt Lake City, you're on Heart of the Matter. You're wrong. Good. That's uh, fun to say, huh? About what? You're just wrong. <laughs> All right. Nothing okay, else? So, uh, We're getting back to the old days. I'm loving this. Yeah. So you're talking about they, they couldn't cross over because of their unbelief? Yeah. So where does belief come from? It comes from God. Man centered or God centered? It's God. Well, then you're a Calvinist. Oh, boy. Um, See, that's the line. Is it, it's either there's belief man centered unto... or God centered. I agree, because of their unbelief, they couldn't cross, but where does the belief come from? Through grace alone. Okay, listen, I agree that there is grace unto salvation, and then there is abiding in the vine. And you have a choice. How do you abide in the vine? You Do abide. That, God. that grace, that, that power. That faith is different, Ray. And because if it wasn't, then we the wouldn't have. From where does but, faith but, come no, from? Wait, 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 wait. I answered God. You right. 
Okay, I'm wrong, but just listen. If we uh, abide in the vine because God keeps us there by bestowing upon us abundances of faith, why do I have over half the New Testament warning about leaving? Why do we have teachings against false doctrines? Why do we worry about all this stuff? Why do we go to church? If, and all these warnings about losing faith if God is the one who keeps us tapped into the vine, Ray? We go to church because that's where the lambs are fed. Why are you fed, Ray? Because the shepherd feeds his flock. Why? Because they need food. They love why, food. Why do they, they need food? And if they didn't have food, then they couldn't believe. Okay, so if they don't hear the word of God and they're not fed by the shepherds, they don't believe? Does God stop giving them the faith you're saying he gives everybody and keeps them tapped in with? I think you're wrong, Ray. No, I think God is the source of all faith. And without God giving you the, the spirit and the faith, you can't do anything. I agree with that when it comes to salvation. But when it comes to maintaining and going on and that carrying... That works. You might as well go to the temple. You have to go to okay, the temple that's, to that's keep a, it up. That's a ridiculous, that's a ridiculous just, comment, Ray. Over Mormonism. Ray, no, it's not. It's the Bible. I, and, and so, you know, maybe Mormonism is tapped into something you need to look at. Ooh, He's describing the means. He provides the means. Okay, again, let's, okay, Ray, Ray, let's go down that. Grace. Ray, let's go down that, let's go down that thought again, okay? Why are the shepherds feeding? You said so that they will believe. Why? If God gives them the belief, why are they, why does the scripture warn constantly about being betrayed and misled and false prophets and all the stuff that goes in? Why, Ray, if God is the one who gives you the faith to stay in the vine? Because that's the means he uses. Well, what if it's not done, Ray? What if what's not done? What if the flock isn't fed? Done, done equals do. Do we do or not do? Okay, so wait a second. So we have to do in order for God's work to be done? No, we don't do anything. Okay, so what if are you he saying? Takes over, we're done. It's finished. It is finished. There's no more doing. Okay, so why all the warnings against falling away, like I just read from two passages, and I could have given you seven more? Why the warnings? Two believers, Ray. Because that's the means that he uses. You're not, that, that's completely illogical. On one hand, you're saying he is the one who keeps us in no matter what. And on the other hand, he says the means he keeps us in is by us being warned and hearing the word and going to church. Well, I know I'm in and I know when uh, I hear the Now warning. we're going to a personal testimony, Ray, and you're the Mormon. You see, now you're going to your personal. Well, I know you're an idiot. Ah! I got to do that first time in the history. Yes, I feel good. Oh my gosh, I've been waiting for that for six months. <laughs> it's fun to do it to a Mormon, but it's fun to do it to anybody. <laughs> okay, we're, Ray's still on, by the way. Uh, the, <laughs> we're, going, we're going to Sadia on line three. Sadia, you're on the air. Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing good. Um, I just want to call in and say you're doing a great job. I've learned so much from you. Me and my husband started watching you like about a week ago, and we've just watched a lot of your previous shows about the LDS Church, and we have learned, I mean, so much from you, and I, you're, you're an inspiration, and you should just thank, keep doing thank, what you're doing. Thanks, Sadia. No comment? Um, <laughs> She's trying to think about We it. just wanted to call in and say oh. how good you're doing, really. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. You didn't just see that last thing, did you? Pardon? You didn't just see that last caller and me, did you? No, I didn't actually, because they had me on hold, so I was trying to go as far away, because we're watching you on the computer, so we're, I'm trying to go away as far from the computer, so it doesn't screw up or anything. So I got I didn't it. really watch. Well, thank you so much. I really, but you're in Canada? Yeah, we're way up here in Canada. I hear it in your voice. That was kind of Scottish. Canada, but. <laughs> God bless you, my All friend. Right. Thanks for watching. Yeah, keep it up. Okay, thanks. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. We're going to Gary, also in Ontario, Canada, on line two. Gary, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hi. Hi, Sean. Hi, uh, Gary. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, I just want to say I'm really encouraged by uh, all that you're saying and, uh, 
even though I don't, I do disagree with you, but uh, I am encouraged, and I just want to thank you so much for um, all you've been doing. But uh, I was just wondering, uh, there's, there's a passage, I'm not sure what it says, but uh, in in John, First John, it says that whoever leaves uh, the church was never really with us. Um, do, you, do you know what passage that is? No, I don't. But find okay. it and call back, because, uh, you know, this is good to dialogue this way. We have yeah. to figure out how to balance those passages with the other ones and see what it comes, what it amounts to. But I appreciate you giving me the insights to it. Sure. And uh, I was just wondering what your view is on, uh, like, I know you, you probably don't like titles like Calvinism and Arminianism, but uh, do you stand on any of those things? I know, uh, you know, I'm not really into systems either, but uh, no. I stand more on, on Calvinism. But I was wondering what you stand on. You know, I, I don't stand on Arminianism. I don't, because Arminianism really boils down to in the end that you have to work to maintain that salvation. And, uh, okay. and, and I don't believe that at all. You have to give up and relax to maintain that salvation. That's the difference. Okay. Uh, Calvinism, I'm certainly against. And, and not only from the, from the principles of what Calvin taught, but from Calvin as a man. You know, we really went after, when we did Mormonism, after Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and their character. And, and I realize that we are all fallen characters, but when you do things in the name of God and you impose things in the name of God, there's a difference between that and just being a, a, a corrupt person. And they would okay. do things in the name of God, and Calvin did. And uh, he made everybody in Geneva go to church. I mean, the guy was a, he was a freak. Sorry. Uh, it's not supposed to judge me, anyway. but anyway, uh, so I have problems with that. I have problems with all systems, including my own, and that's why I'm constantly evolving and changing with them. So don't trust me. And uh, there's cool. there's what it is, Gary. Okay, one last question. Um, what's your uh, view on like election? Then, even though the Bible speaks about it, like Romans nine, Romans eight, uh, Ephesians one. What's your view on that? I, I believe that we are all elected. I believe God would not have any be lost. I think that he wants all to be saved and he uh, predestined all to receive him, but only some do. I believe that he elected the nation of Israel to carry forth a certain work. I believe he elects believers today to carry forth a certain work. And I don't think believers know the end result of what's happening in the end any more than the Jews knew that, that Gentiles were gonna come in and pick up the baton. So I think that they were blinded to what we would do, and the church today is blinded to what God is going to do with wh how he's called us to work. And that's how I okay. see election. But I do believe he does elect for certain purposes. Okay. Uh, one last thing. I'm sorry. This is the last thing. <laughs> um, like, my desire is to... I live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and uh, my desire is to really come out there in Utah and really help you guys out. That's been my desire for years. And so I was wondering, how can I like contact you and speak with you? Uh, you know, if you email me and uh, tell me, you know, we had this conversation in the byline, then uh, someone will give it to me and tell me, and I'll give you my phone number and we can talk. Okay, what, what's your email? It's Sean. <laughs> can we put up a graphic? Uh, are you watching yeah. the show? Go to HOT. Uh, yeah, Go to HOT. Go to HOT. Go, Go to HOTM.TV. And you can get it okay. right. Okay, Gary, thanks. Thank you. Bye. God, God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Boy, that guy doesn't know what he's doing. If he wants to come here and get involved with us, he's looking for a life of misery and woe. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> listen, um, love you guys. Keep hanging in. Keep in the word of God. Because I present things with such authority, doesn't mean I'm always right. I teach this way because I'm passionate about what it says. I believe I have a certain aspect that is true, but of course I'm wrong. But this is why we do this. There's nothing wrong with questioning and doubting and probing and saying Calvinism stinks. Bring it, go look into it yourself. This is what we did with Mormonism. Hey, this is what Mormons teach. This is what their history did. And you look it up for yourself. This is what we're doing with you. I mean, you have to. God wants us to worship him with all parts of ourselves, including our minds. It's not worship if you're not using your mind and you're just dolefully going along and listen to some, some internet dude. So get your Bibles out. 
read, pray, go to a church, figure things out, argue, doubt, and it will come together. God, it will be God honoring. He loves that, I believe. He made us that way. We'll see you next week here on Heart of the Matter. <coughs> <coughs>